conducted by Prof. Seth Gilbert. And his talk will be on optimism, pessimism, and algorithms. Okay. Hey, how's everyone doing? Awfully good to be here in person. I've, uh, uh, this is the, I think the first uh, in-person seminar I've given in I can't remember how long. It's awfully nice to have real people to talk to, as well as all of you who are, uh, who are watching online. Uh, let's see, yeah, we have some people online, excellent. Um, so this is great. Thank you all for inviting me. I'm here today to ask you an important question. Oop, except I can't because, good. I'm here today to ask you an important question. Are you an optimist or a pessimist? This is the question at hand. And to help with this important philosophic question, I have two um, uh, characters we've invited here to help for a little conversation. On the one side, we have our friend Zafad Diebelbrox, one happy fruit, the eternal optimist, the inventor of the pan-galactic gargle blaster, two heads, three arms, born on the planet of Betelgeuse or nearby, lives in the best of all possible worlds. He is gonna be our representative optimist today. On the other side of things, we have over here Marvin, the paranoid android. Marvin, on the other hand, alas, he was an early AI with a genuine people personality. Alas, depressed, okay? He is the ship's robot on the heart of gold, brain the size of a planet, and always expects the worst. And in fact, he is often right. Of course, what we want to talk about today is optimism and pessimism in the context of algorithms. Here, Zafod is pointing out that we should really be optimizing for the common case. You know, we're all taught early on the 90-10 rule. 90% of the time, you're executing 10% of your code. Focus on that common case. Optimize that common case. Right? Most of the time, it's all going to work out well. Maximize your performance at all costs. This is the story of the optimist. On the other hand, there are some risks to that. In fact, there are some argument, some argue you should really be preparing for the worst. You know, Murphy's law, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Always be prepared. Reality will be worse than the worst case you predicted. There's a lot of good psychology research to this effect. We as humans are terrible at planning for the worst. We are always too optimistic, it turns out, almost all of the time. A great quote by Adams, the creator of Marvin here, who said a common mistake that people make when trying to design something completely foolproof is to underestimate the ingenuity of complete fools. Okay. Lots of things can go wrong. Oop. Including this clicker, it seems. How about that? Uh, okay, so what I want to talk about then is this trade-off uh, between optimism and pessimism, between focusing on the common case, optimizing for the common case, and protecting yourself against the worst case. Okay. And I claim this is actually one of the very fundamental design trade-offs. It shows up in algorithm design and almost any other sort of design type task you are thinking about. Okay. There's always this trade-off between sort of the common case and the worst case. And so what I wanna do today is I wanna talk about uh, sort of three short vignettes, three short stories uh, about optimism, pessimism, and algorithms. Sort of three cases that have arisen in my research uh, where we have to trade off these things and we want to try to get the best of both worlds. Okay. Great. So I actually have a, a, a small secret agenda here, um, which is uh, I'd like to also at the same time try to give you a insider's view of what algorithms research looks like. I'm assuming that the large part of my audience here, that most of the audience here, uh, you all are involved in computing one way or another. Most of you are computing students, I think. But my guess is that most of you are probably not currently planning a career in research, and especially probably not in more theoretical algorithms research. So part of my goal is I want to sort of give you a little bit of a view of what that's like. Uh, you know, as we go along, sort of hidden in this talk, I'm going to try to answer questions like, you know, how do I choose research problems? How practical should theoretical research be? 
you know, do I care if it actually works or not? It's theory, right? How long does it take for algorith algorithmic ideas to actually impact practice? These are the sorts of sort of hidden, hidden questions I'm going to try to answer as we go along. Great. And so in that, in that vein, sort of before I really get started, let me talk a little bit for a sec about sort of my goal as a researcher. So as I said, I am mostly a theorist. I consider myself, I'm an al I, I focus on algorithm, algorithmic research, especially algorithms for distributed systems. Okay. And I want to invent algorithms that are interesting and useful and that will impact future real world systems. Okay, this is my goal. This is what I want to accomplish. Okay. So how do you do that? Well, one thing I think that's important is you have to try to live in the future, right? When I think about what problems I want to work on, I think about the long-term trends. I don't want to solve the problems that Google, Apple, Microsoft, et cetera, are solving today. They're really good at that. I don't want to be competing with them. I want to focus on the problems that they're going to run into five or 10 years down the road. Okay. Other thing, I want to be doing theory that's predictive. I think that, that algorithmic theory should predict real world consequences. The extent that we are proving things that have no impact on the world, that may be wonderful, that may be beautiful, but that's not what I'm trying to do here. Okay. So these are just sort of background to keep in mind as we talk about uh, the stories ahead. Of course, really, why do I really study the algorithms? No, they're beautiful, they're neat, and I love struggling with hard puzzles, but that's beside the point. That's not philosophy, that's just real life. Okay, good. So let me get on to sort of the three little stories I have here. Uh, we have, at least in person, a fairly small audience, so feel free to stop me and ask questions. We can have a conversation. I don't know how usually you deal with questions online, but those of you watching online, again, feel free to send off questions. I have lots of slides. If we don't get to stuff, that's fine. Okay, so the first little story I want to talk about is related to blockchains, related to cryptocurrencies. You know, we all like money, right? Money is great. Uh, on the other hand, this is a classic case of optimism versus pessimism. Uh, do you think it will succeed? Do you think it will fail? I do not know. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about technically what blockchains are. I think the next talk today is going to actually spend more time talking about about distributed finance and some of the exciting stuff that's happening. Okay, uh, but for today's purpose, we're just going to deal. Think of a blockchain as essentially a distributed ledger. Ledgers have been around forever, right? Uh, back to 3200 BC, people were keeping lists of transactions, no problem. Uh, you know, it just says, "Gee, Alice transferred fifty dollars to Bob. Carol transferred ten dollars to Bob. No problem, just a list of transactions. That's all we need to think of as a blockchain." Well, actually, a blockchain is really a distributed version of this. It's not just one copy. Well, we're going to keep lots of copies of this ledger. And sort of the key exciting insight, which if you think about it, isn't so surprising, is that as long as everyone keeps the same copy of the ledger, the same transactions in the exact same order, everything's going to work fine, right? Uh, you know, if someone wants to add a transaction to the ledger, no problem. As long as it's synchronized with everyone else, it's going to work fine, okay? And of course, the reason everyone's so excited about this is that you can store not just monetary transactions, you can store all, all sorts of your favorite transactions. If you want to store a transaction to pointing Satoshi, emperor of the universe, go right ahead, add that to the blockchain. Uh, or maybe you assign ownership of people to, some, to someone or other. Uh, maybe you, uh, you know, maybe you want to have something, a uh, transaction that says, gee, if Apple stock ever goes above, you know, $300 before the end of December, 2022, then transfer $1,000 to Alice. That's sort of a fun type of transaction, right? Anyways, as I said, I don't want to get into any of that. What I do want to say, though, is while Bitcoin is super new and cryptocurrencies are super new, it turns out that blockchains were kind of invented back in 1978. And I'm not here giving away the secret of Satoshi's identity. I would, in fact, bet a lot of money that Leslie Lamport is not Satoshi, uh, for reasons I'll get to in a second. Um, but in fact, Lamport back in 1978 uh, basically invented what we think of as blockchains today. Of course, he didn't call them that. He called them replicated state machines, bunch of servers replicated, keeping track of the same state over time. Okay, uh, good. And there's been a ton of work ever since then uh, in, all, in the 80s and 90s studying these replicated state machines, studying Byzantine agreement, studying how would you implement something like a cryptocurrency? Right? 
So this was all in some sense not new at all when cryptocurrencies came along. So you might ask, and I think a good question to ask, is why did it take so long for cryptocurrencies to be implemented, right? So if this has been around since forever, since the, you know, 1978, why did we only get Bitcoin in 2009? And even now we're only, we're still seeing uh, huge amounts of development, right? Like what's happened in between? And I think there are sort of several interesting answers to this question. Okay. I mean, first of all, you might say, well, gee, research always takes a while to get from sort of algorithmic theory into the real world. Five to 10 years is pretty normal. Maybe you say, I've heard some people argue there were some critical crypto developments in the 2000s that led to Bitcoin, right? There was some new understanding of, 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 of hash functions, new understanding of proof of work. Uh, this is what really enabled it. Maybe we didn't need digital currency until the 2000s, right? There, you know, in the 1990s, there wasn't enough of an internet to matter. We didn't need Bitcoin. These are all fine answers and worth thinking about. But I'd also like to suggest that at least one of the reasons here is that Leslie Lamport, you know, he is an algorithmic pessimist. Okay, if you ever talk to him, this will come across instantly. Uh, you know, he, 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 this is one of, this is a, this is a quote from Lamport. Uh, a distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. Okay. Leslie Lamport is convinced that everything is going to go wrong and it will. Okay. By the way, if you talk, he is also quite an entertaining person. It shows that being an algorithmic pessimist and being a uh, entertaining, happy person are not at all unrelated. Um, for example, he has this great paper on hair color in France, uh, if you're interested in seeing another side of Lamport, but I digress. Um, so, you know, really when Lamport first introduced this idea of consensus replicated state machines, um, he was really focused on guaranteeing things will be correct 100% of the time no exceptions, okay? Consensus protocols had to be 100% safe, no probability of error, no chance anything could go wrong, okay? He also, by the way, thought 15 minutes per transaction was ridiculous. Uh, so part of the focus was on performance, but I think a large part of this was the focus on, uh, you know, we need to actually make this work and work 100% of the time. Okay. Satoshi, by the other on the other hand, I claim was an algorithmic optimist. Let's build it and see what happens. Okay. It, it turns out, you know, Bitcoin can fail, right? There is some, if you work out the math, there is some probability that someone can steal all your money, but it's very unlikely. And in fact, in practice, it's turned out to work well. It's one right now, today, one of the most battle-tested distributed protocols in existence. I don't think there's been any other protocol that's been hammered on quite as hard as Bitcoin has over the last several years. Okay, so in some sense, this is a win for Satoshi the optimist. Okay, uh, and so good. In some sense, by the way, I'd suggest that Satoshi, this this sort of Bitcoin and Satoshi, encompasses a whole bunch of the Silicon Valley ethos, right? Silicon Valley is full of these type of of optimistic startups. Uh, let's build it and see what happens. Focus on optimizing for the common case. Don't waste your time worrying about these strange corner cases. You know, optimize the most common use case. That's how you win as a product. Um, okay, so, so far the story goes, uh, we had replicated state machines since 1978. Alas, we were very pessimistic. We didn't even try to make something like a cryptocurrency. Satoshi the optimist came along and made it happen. Where are we today? What do I worry about as a researcher? Well, looking around, the things I worry about are right now, the cost per transaction is very high and growing. Energy costs are growing all the time. Proof of work costs are growing. Uh, gas fees, the number of transactions per day is growing. All of these things are rapidly overwhelming the current uh, distributed uh, blockchains we have today. Okay, so here's what I've been asking. What if we're even more optimistic? What if we want to assume, let's assume even more that everything's going to be fine. Maybe we don't need all of this super expensive Byzantine fault tolerance nonsense. Maybe with a little more optimism, we can really make these protocols you know, scale much better, okay? Alas, if we do that, someone's gonna steal all our money. That doesn't seem like a good idea. Maybe we should at least watch and see what happens. Oop, good. Uh, okay, so, so that's the plan then. 
we're going to see if we can reduce the fault tolerance and yet still keep track of who is who might be stealing our money. So this is the idea of accountability. As I said, this has been a research interest of mine over the last couple of years. Instead of trying to fully prevent all bad behavior, we are just going to watch what happens, observe the bad behavior, and try to catch and punish the wrongdoers. So we will start with optimism. We'll design an energy efficient, high throughput blockchain protocol that's not quite as resistant to attack as current ones. But we'll be a little bit pessimistic too. We're not going to fully embrace our inner Zaphod. We're going to maintain enough pessimism to log enough information uh, that we can detect bad behavior, that we can figure out who are the bad actors. And of course, the key to accountability is consequences, right? If someone steals all our money, we should be able to prove that they violated the protocol and stole our money, and we should have some way to punish them, okay? For example, by slashing their account, taking the money back, whatever it needs be, okay? So this is the idea of accountability and of accountable uh, agreement protocols. So an accountable protocol is one where if any user violates the protocol, eventually every honest user will obtain cryptographically secure evidence that proves their bad behavior. Okay. So does it work? Uh, well, here are the things I would like to be true. These are claims and conjectures, not necessarily truth, but these are things I would like to be true. I would like to claim that countable protocols can be more energy efficient than traditional protocols, as they don't need to provide as strong protection. I think they can be faster because, again, they don't need to provide a strong protection, and they can tolerate larger fractions of dishonest users. In addition, they should disincentivize bad behavior, right? If you know that if you steal my money, I'm going to catch you and take it back, well, why waste your time? So there is an incentive factor here that should play into it. So what have we done? Uh, well, a couple of years ago, we had sort of a proof of concept, uh, which was called Polygraph. Uh, this was actually integrated into the Red Belly blockchain, which is a Australia-based uh, blockchain, uh, and it, but essentially is a proof of concept for accountability. Uh, it focuses on tolerating arbitrary-sized Byzantine attacks, uh, even more than the one-half or one-third fractions you're supposed to be able to tolerate, uh, and so it shows that accountability is an idea that can work. Okay. Since then, just this year, uh, we have a something appearing on the screen. Uh, just this year, we have a sort of new, a new sort of accountability gadget that tries to make accountability easy. Almost a little plugin that you can add to any existing agreement protocol or consensus protocol like a blockchain uh, that, will, that will make uh, accountability an easy add-on to any existing protocol. Uh, and then we're not the only ones who've been interested in accountability. Uh, it turns out that these folks over at uh, Ethereum, like Victor Buterin, have also been interested in accountability. Around the same time we were working on this, uh, they have at the same time introduced Casper, the friendly finality gadget, okay? which is their attempt to make Ethereum accountable. Their attempt to ensure that if you try to violate the Ethereum protocol, uh, we can prove who was doing that and slash your accounts. This is part of their attempt to move from uh, move to proof of stake, for example. Anyways, uh, so I'd like to argue that accountability seems like a interesting trade-off point between optimism and pessimism. On the one hand, it seems like optimism pays off. If we ignore a little bit of the possibility of attack, we can make our systems more efficient. On the other hand, we need some good pessimism here. We need to ensure that uh, we need to ensure that we can punish the wrongdoers when they do something wrong. Okay, so this is my short story on blockchains. What's up? Everything okay? Okay, good. So let me move on to my second little vignette about optimism versus pessimism. So some point back in the day, you might have been sitting in a introductory algorithms classroom, uh, and you probably had some old, old professor standing up there and saying something like, let me tell you about asymptotic analysis. You know, f of n equals omega of g of n if there exists, and, and this person just droned on like this in some unintelligible manner, right? We've all been there, yes? Okay. And, you know, some clever student in the front row, usually back in pre-COVID days anyways, would raise their hand 
and say, wait a sec, I don't care about all this worst case nonsense. You know, I want algorithms that work in the real world. Stop with your worst case whatever. And you know, the, the old gray haired professor would say something like, well, in most cases, worst case analysis provides useful insights about which algorithms are useful and which are not. And they drone on for a bit longer. Okay. But then, you know, sometimes uh, the, the, the clever student says, you know, enough of this, let me go actually build something. You know, I want to go out and build my, my new cryptocurrency, the Beeble coin. And again, the, the academic tells you, no, we can't. Consensus is hard. It's slow. Worst case, it's impossible. You can't do it. Uh, remember, I told you, Leslie Lamport's a pessimist. It works well with Marvin here. Then the optimist goes off and says, okay, I've done it. It works. No problem. The theorist then says, but that, that can't be. In theory, this is a hard problem. You can't be doing that. You know, done it, don't care, released, ICO, billionaire, bye. Okay, uh, does this conversation sound familiar? Anyway, so this raises the question, how should we be analyzing algorithms? Should we be listening to this sort of old fashioned worst case analysis? Or should we be thinking more about this, the, the common case? You know, what can we actually do? What are the important things here? Same, same discussion, okay? I'd, I'd claim that this is sort of two ends of a spectrum, right? On the one hand, let me think of this person who cares about the common case as primarily as thinking about, maybe we should think about just choosing an input at random and see how well it works. That's one notion of common case, right? Just choose a random input, see how well it works. As compared to the sort of traditional, you know, computer science view of let's always look at the worst case. What I wanna talk about is a little bit somewhere in between. I intentionally drew this on close to the worst case side of things, but I'd like to be able to relax that a little bit. I'd like to be able to say, well, what if we don't care about the very worst case? What if we want, you know, to be a little optimistic here? What can we do then? Okay. So the, this approach has been called smooth analysis. This was introduced by Spielman and Tang in 2004. Uh, and it was actually sort of invented to answer a, a mystery, which is, why does the simplex method work so well in practice? So if you've, if you've seen linear programming before, the simplex method is a very old method from like 1960s or so, maybe older than that, for, for solving linear programs. And basically all the time, it works super fast. In practice, it's excellent. Alas, we can show, the theorists among us can show that in the worst case, it's exponential time. So how can that be? Worst case exponential time, in practice, super fast. Remember I said theory should be predictive of reality. When you have a gap like this, we should think about why. And so Spielman and Chang invented, invented uh, smooth analysis as a way of answering that. And the way they want to look at it was imagine you start with that worst case input, and then you add a little bit of noise. The world is noisy, right? If you add a little bit of noise, if, you're, if you have some real measured data and you're running a linear program on it, it's noisy data in the first place. Might as well add a little bit more noise. And it turns out if you add a little bit of noise, the simplex method works, you can prove it will work fast. Okay. So here was the idea of smooth analysis. Instead of looking at the worst case, look at the worst case plus a little bit of noise. Okay, when is this useful? This is useful if bad cases are rare. This is useful if the bad cases are unstable, a little bit of noise disturbs them. Uh, and it's useful if the bad cases are unlikely to occur in the real world. Okay, that's what we wanna show here. Okay, so this is, a, this is another one of these directions I've been interested in for a bit, which is, can we use this technique to ensure that our nice theoretical analysis of distributed systems is somehow predictive of what we're gonna see in the real world? Okay. Great, uh, so what have I been looking at in this context? I've been looking at dynamic networks. This has been the area I've been focusing on. By dynamic networks, I mean networks that are changing a lot all the time, right? And at every time step, the network changes. Someone new arrives or leaves. New, new links will show up or be destroyed. So of course, you might think about mobile networks, of course, overlay networks, certainly. Uh, or you might care about blockchains. Underlying a blockchain is a very dynamic system where people are constantly arriving and leaving. Unfortunately, if you look at this from a worst case perspective, dynamic networks are terrible. Everything can go wrong. Marvin will tell you here that, you know, each of these problems, any of even the simplest problems are totally broken in a dynamic network. You know, simple problems, random walks, flooding time, aggregating data, and so on. All of these are bad 
uh, in dynamic networks. In the worst case, we can build you examples where you, know, you can't solve anything non-trivial in a dynamic network. If things are changing, you're stuck. But of course, this isn't the reality we experience, right? Look around the internet, lots of things actually work. So again, we have this gap between reality where things work and theory, which says nothing you do should work at all. So what we've been, we're trying to do was apply smooth analysis to this. Yeah. Right, so the, the conclusion is, you know, you can't do anything. Good. So what if we try smooth analysis? What if we add a little noise? Okay. This was the question we were looking at. Uh, for this, we wanted to think of, okay, we have this dynamic sequence of graphs. The world is changing. We don't control it. We don't want to assume it's totally random, right? You could just assume maybe every graph is random. Maybe the whole world is just random every step. That's not so great though, okay? But let's say, fine, we're gonna let the evil adversary choose exactly what happens. But then we're going to randomly perturb things a little bit. We're gonna randomly add or delete a few edges from the graph and see how much that changes things, right? If you only have to add or remove one random link in a network to break the bad example, it probably wasn't a very realistic bad example anyways, right? That was the theory. Okay, good. So what we were thinking about then is we want to sort of know, how, you know when does this help? For what types of problems does perturbing things help or for what types of problems are really actually hard? Again, we should be predictive. We should say which problems are really hard and which ones aren't, okay? How much noise do you need? This matters, right? Adding one, one edge makes sense. One network link seems reasonable. If I have to change the whole network to make it work, maybe not. Okay. And again, we get things like is the existing analysis robust, fragile, et cetera. And what we found, well, we found that in some cases it mattered, in some cases it didn't. Uh, so in particular, we found that for some problems like random walks, a little bit of smoothing makes the problem vanish. Right? You know, all the bad analysis for random walks, I think, is not real. It doesn't show up in the real world. You perturb things a little bit, everything is fine. For some problems like aggregation, it turns out there is something really hard going on. For these problems down here, there are problems where even a little bit of perturbation doesn't make your life better. And then there's some in the middle, like flooding, where it helps a little bit, but not a lot. Okay. So my claim is that this type of more refined analysis gives us, as theorists, a better tool for predicting real world performance. Okay. And so again, I think we have the moral of the story that I think optimism pays off. If we're willing to not worry about those very, very worst case examples, we get better predictions of how real world systems work. At the same time, you do have to be careful that bad examples do exist. You shouldn't ignore them entirely. Okay. Great. I think that brings me to my third little story here, okay? And this is the one that involves, this is most sort of forward-looking in the sense the, these first two are things I've worked on a bunch. This third relates to things I'm interested in working on now. So I'm, I'm telling you mostly about other stuff that's been happening. So where should I start here? Let me start with an example. Let me start with a bloom filter. What is a bloom filter? Think of a dictionary. It's, a, it's something that stores a set of items. That's all that matters for today, right? A bloom filter is something where you store a set of items, like say these type, these words, these type of animals. I can search for it and I'll get a yes or no answer. Yes, a horse is in your set. No, a hawk is not in your set. That's all that matters for today. Okay. A bloom filter has a particular nice theoretical property. It has well, it might have false negatives and false positives. What do I mean by that? A false positive is when you search for a word, it says, yes, true, it's here, but it's wrong, it's not actually there. False negative, you search for the word, it says false, it's not there, but it really is there, okay? So what do we know about bloom filters? Well, we know that bloom filters have no false negatives, that's great. If you get the answer no, it really is no, okay? If you get the answer yes, there's some probability that it's wrong. And that probability depends on how big your bloom filter is. The bigger the bloom filter, the lower the rate of false positives. The smaller the bloom filter, the more false positives. Okay, good. So what about, what? how else might you solve this problem? 
Well, a couple of years ago, some people pointed out, wait a sec, we have a, we have a better solution for this. We don't need your silly bloom filters. You know, we, you know, AI is taking over the world. Machine learning solves everything. You should just use a neural network classifier. They are excellent tools. Uh, simply train your classifier on the set of things you want and don't want. Done. You don't need your bloom filter anymore. Okay. So it turns out, so again, you're, you imagine some sort of classifier takes the words as input, produces a true false output. You can make this work. It turns out to be quite space efficient. In general, if you, if you use it on good data, it has a fairly low false positive rate. It's very good on common items, those that were in the training set. Okay. So here was an idea where in, maybe instead of these old fashioned data structures, we can replace them with newfangled machine learning classifiers. On the other hand, though, you should be careful. Uh, what happens when you get rare cases? What happens when you get queries, when you get words that this thing was not trained on, right? So the problem with a lot of these type of classifiers is they work super well when the input they're getting matches the training data. And they work super terribly when the input does not match the training data, okay? You can get terrible disasters in that case. Okay, so this is sort of the optimist. The optimist says, hey, we can do better by using the classifier. The pessimist says, uh-oh, this is gonna lead to more errors, at least in the worst case. So what can you do? Can we get optimism and pessimism together? And so here was the proposal. What if we combine the best of both worlds? We take our nice little classifier on one side. If the classifier says, yes, we say, great, we've really seen this thing before. Uh, this must've been in the training data we should just output yes. Okay. But if the classifier says no, uh-oh, we don't really know. It might, it might just be something that wasn't in the training data, but really, you know, we should double check. Okay. Well, then we have this backup filter over here. We have our bloom filter. Uh, and we then ask the bloom filter, which says either, yes, it really is there or no, it's not. Okay. And so by combining the optimism of our classifier and the pessimism of our bloom filter, we actually get the best of both worlds it turns out. Okay. So it's still optimized for the common case. You still get the good performance of the classifier, but you also get the good, the good no false negative guarantees and so on that you would get from a bloom filter. And of course, how much space does this use? In practice, it uses less space than a bloom filter it does by itself. So we've actually achieved, we can actually have the bloom filter be a lot smaller than it would have had to be before to get, to get just as good or better results. Okay. And oh, you can't see at the top, there's a reference over here. This was from the paper called The Case for Learned Index Structures. Oh, there's some people at Google mostly. And then of course, Michael Mitzenmacher came along and said, wait a sec, we can do even better than that. In fact, what he showed is that if you're even a little more optimistic, right? We had a bloom filter in the beginning, then we have our classifier in the middle, and then we have another bloom filter. This sandwich version would do even better. You can get even smaller, uh, even less space, and, um, and even less space with just as good performance. Okay. So this is sort of the bloom filter story or the, the learning augmented bloom filter story. Okay. So what does this tell us? What sort of, uh, what should we be thinking about then? So when I, when I look at this, the natural question is where else can we do this? Where else can we combine the optimism of machine learning that's optimized for the common case with traditional algorithms, which give us worst case guarantees. Can we obtain both simultaneously? Let me give you two other quick examples where this has worked so far. Uh, and then we can think about where it does not work yet. Let's take a simple example. Uh, perhaps this is where I should have started. This, this is the simplest example I can think of, which is what about just searching for data in a sorted array? This is like, you know, algorithms 101, first week of algorithms class, right? Well, you could imagine that you had some nice little uh, trained machine learning oracle over here, and you've trained it on your data, it has a pretty good idea that if you search for 42, it's going to be over here in cell number 10. Okay, so maybe if this oracle is good, it tells you exactly where to look for your data in your array, you find it immediately. Okay. Great. On the other hand, in this case, if it's wrong, then you're way off and things aren't any good, right? Uh, maybe it tells you to look over here, it's wrong, now your algorithm is no good at all. So obviously we want to combine the best of both of them, right? We want to first uh, ask our little our, our predictor, where should I find my data? Check if it's there, 
If it's there, we win. If it's not, well, just fall back on a regular binary search, no problem. Okay. This gives us, you know, in the common case, super fast performance, and yet we still have good worst case guarantees. Okay, so this is nice. We have a good trade off between if it's good, we get something good. If it's bad, we get something bad. What we really want, though, is a smooth interpolation between the, the two, right? We like the fact that, that we would like this not to be a sort of binary good, bad thing, but there to be a range of possible uh, uh, values. Okay. So, in particular, if the machine learning oracle is almost right, imagine it tells us to look at cell nine. That's pretty good, right? It's only off by one. Uh, you know, we shouldn't have to do a, we shouldn't have to go to a full binary search just to make up for that. And of course, it turns out you can pretty easily do that, right? Uh, this isn't too hard. Instead of just doing a binary search afterwards, you should just do an exponential search, start wherever the predictor told you to go, and just search from that point outwards. Okay. Now we're going to get a running time that depends on both the error, how good is your predictor, and still has good worst case guarantees. So I claim this is the ideal. When we combine predictors and worst case algorithms, we want both. We'd like something where the performance depends on the, uh, the performance depends on how good your predictor is, but still provides good worst case guarantees. That's sort of the, the goal. I had one more example here, but I don't, well, I don't know if I have time or not. Let's see. Uh, the other example I had, the last example I had here was the ski rental problem. Okay. We've all been doing a lot of skiing lately, right? Okay, maybe not. Um, the ski rental problem is one of these classic online problems. I, have a, I, I wanna go skiing, should I rent or buy skis? Okay. Every day I have to decide, should I ski today? Ski, 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 yes. And at some point there's no more skiing. Why? I don't know, I broke my leg, I can't ski anymore. Um, okay, so at the beginning, every day I decide, should I rent my skis or should I buy them? Okay. And so of course, if I'm only going to ski for five days and it costs $8 to buy, I'm better off renting. And conversely, if I do the other than the other. So there is a sort of standard classical two approximate solution. If you buy, you wait the first B days, it costs B dollars, you wait the first B days, you buy skis on day B plus one. The most you'll ever pay is 2B, and that guarantees you you'll be within a factor of two of optimal. Okay. Deterministically, that's the best you can do. Great. So what happens then if we have our little machine learning oracle here that predicts how long we're going to ski for? It says, hey, I think that you're going to enjoy skiing for about seven days. That's its prediction. Okay. So one thing we could do is we could just say, great, uh, we should just listen to the oracle. It says seven days. If B is bigger than seven, then we should not buy skis. If B is less than seven, we should buy skis. Good enough. Okay. That's sort of the simple the simple thing to do, okay, right, that's, uh, no, whoops, I've stepped ahead, one step ahead. But of course, if you just listen to the Oracle, it might be very wrong. Here's an example where the Oracle is totally wrong and you can waste a lot of money, okay? So we wanna be a little more clever. We don't wanna just do whatever the Oracle says. We'd like to somehow hedge our bets. So if the Oracle is right, we do well. And if the Oracle is wrong, then we don't hurt too much. Okay, so it turns out that this gives you a, a good solution. Uh, and I guess I'll leave this as an exercise to think about later, if you like. Uh, so it turns out that the right thing to do is if the Oracle, so Lambda here is just a parameter on how much you trust the Oracle, okay? It's a, a tunable parameter. And so what happens if the Oracle says Q, that's how many days you wanna go skiing. Then if Q is bigger than B, you buy on day Lambda Q. So if lambda is a half, this means you wait Q over two days. Okay. Conversely, uh, if it turns out that Q is less than B, then you say, okay, I'll buy my skis on day B over lambda. So again, if lambda is a half, that means you wait till day 2B to buy your skis. Okay. Uh, and it turns out that this is a great way of using our predictor. If our predictor is right, we'll do well. And if it's bad, we won't get hurt too much. So in the good case, it's one plus lambda competitive. In the bad case, it's one plus one over lambda competitive or let me just plug in the value of a half for that. If you set lambda equal a half, this means that you'll do better than your two, your two approximation if your oracle is good, but you'll never do worse than three competitive even if your oracle is bad, okay? So again, there's this trade-off we wanna get where if our oracle is good, we do well, and if it's bad, we don't hurt too much, okay?
Good. So I think this is an interesting area. This is an area I'm, I, I would like to think about today. Uh, this is the area of research I've been thinking about. It seems there are a lot of uses, a lot of cases that we can, might be able to combine optimism and pessimism this way. So for example, what if we are using machine learning to predict which users in a network are malicious and not following the rules? We can probably tell that. What if we are predicting how much contention there is for a resource? I think everyone wants this resource or no one wants it. What if we're using it to guess how stable or, or reliable a link is in a network? That's useful. What if we're guessing the latency of a link? That's useful. What if we are guessing sort of prop other properties of the network? Okay. I think there are a lot of cases where, and I'm thinking of distributed systems here, especially a lot of cases where we can hopefully get the benefit of the optimistic machine learning prediction while still guaranteeing good worst case performance. And these are essentially all open questions here. Okay, good. So those are the three uh, sort of little stories I want to tell you about optimism and pessimism. Okay. Um, and for each of these, remember I said in the beginning that you know, I, want to, I want to look at trends, long-term trends. For each of these, I claim there are sort of good trends driving this research. For blockchains, I was worried about the future of transaction costs and transaction rates. For smoothing, I was worried about the faster and faster rates of change in networks. And here in this last one, well, what's the big trend? Machine learning is getting awfully good. We should really be able to use this to do something good. Of course, what am I really worried about in terms of trends going forward? Uh, as a, a, distributed, uh, a distributed algorithms researcher, I follow in Leslie Lamport's steps of being fairly pessimistic. I am fairly worried about the fragility of the networks that we, that we are constantly using. I'm, I'm fairly worried about how we optimize for the common case and lead to things breaking. And this is why I'm so interested in trying to find a good way of balancing both the best and worst cases, where we can still get those worst case guarantees, we can still prevent the whole network from crashing uh, while still getting good common case performance. Good, this was just my argument that we need to worry about this. Okay, so with that then, hopefully I have uh, helped you to answer for yourself the question of whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, uh, you know, whether you care more about common case performance or worst case guarantees, and where you want to live on this design spectrum. And I think with that, I will end this talk. Thank you. Any questions? There seems to be a question on the chat, so. Uh, Nato, Nasatoshi asked uh, 29, uh, uh, 2009 is a year after the uh, 08 financial crisis, though. Is that a factor for the change? That's a good. That's a that's a good observation. Yeah, I I, I assume the 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 question here is basically pointing out that maybe one good explanation for why Bitcoin showed up in 2009 uh, is this is the financial crisis of 2008. I think that is actually a a, a good observation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I see it says something about optimism, pessimism, and COVID. Is that what this question is about? Um, yeah. So you know what what COVID what COVID showed us in terms of optimism, pessimism, and design. Uh, I don't know. Um, I think it's in some sense COVID has made a lot of us more pessimistic as people. Whether it's made us whether it tells us anything about design, I'm not sure. It's it does reinforce my concerns that I was saying at the very end about we need to engineer. Uh, we need to engineer robust systems. We need to engineer systems that won't break under load, uh, that won't break when suddenly surprise events like COVID happen. You know, I think robustness is one of the underva undervalued aspects in, in Silicon Valley and startup culture, uh, and that we should we really need to think about how to build robust systems. Uh, on the other hand, the, the counterpoint to that is that things have actually, like the, the tech side of things has actually worked pretty well during COVID, right? I mean, hiccups, nothing's perfect, but you know, man, things like Zoom, this works surprisingly well. There have been surprisingly few problems with suddenly switching everything online. So maybe things aren't as bad as I was worried about. Maybe things are more robust than I expected. 
So I don't know. I think it's a good, it's a good, it's a good thing to think about. Um, there's another question. I'll just read it out for the benefit of. Sure, um, uh, yeah. So if we keep implementing most likely cases in design, would a really smart coder use the worst case to disrupt the whole system? And has something like this ever happened before? Sure. No, and that's when I talk about robustness. That's the type of thing I'm exactly worried about. Uh, that if we spend a lot of, if we spend all our time optimizing for the common case, we are leaving all sorts of room for both surprise events, but also attacks on the system. Uh, so I am, I am absolutely concerned about uh, about issues like that. Uh, has it happened before? Uh, well, you I mean there have been lots, there have been lots of cases when when networks have gone down. Uh, I had the slide a couple things ago with sort of listing a whole bunch of. Uh, the sort of problems on the internet that we've seen. Uh, there's been also there have certainly been lots of hole, holes in the internet, uh, holes in various networks that have caused all sorts of disasters to happen. Uh, there's lots of cases where the systems have not been robust. Uh, is that because we weren't smart enough? Is that because we were focusing on the common case? Is that because uh, we're just not smart enough to find all those holes? I don't know. Uh, but I certainly think that that we definitely have seen lots of disastrous episodes uh, where robustness has been compromised, has, has led to compromised systems. But as you can tell, I'm something of a pessimist. So despite despite the optimistic side of this talk, I think I am I am probably by nature an algorithmic pessimist. I guess I'm kind of the pessimist in the corner there. Excellent. Well, okay, uh, so uh, my question is about the uh, hash map sandwich thing. It's like the bloom filter sandwich yep. thing. Mm -hmm. How does it even work? It's like, aren't we just using two copies of the same bloom filter? Like, how does it even improve anything actually? So and no, you're, you're, you're not, so you're not gonna wanna use two copies of the same bloom filter. In fact, that's exactly, uh, that's exactly right. They're not gonna be the same thing. In particular, the second bloom filter is going to want to be compensating for the things that the that the classifier is failing on, right? So you're gonna you're gonna have to you're gonna have to think about uh, the other thing is that you can make the second bloom filter a lot smaller, right? So in particular, uh, the because because so basically the first bloom filter ends up throwing out most of the most of the 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 nodes, right? So basically the first, you know, bloom filters don't have any false negatives. So even if the bloom filter is fairly small, you'll end up killing off almost all of the nodes right there, okay? Uh, and so the classifier then only has to focus on the positives. And so it basically is out, what it, what it outputs is basically almost entirely correct. And then you only need a very small second bloom filter to compensate. Um, and so this is actually gonna be a lot smaller bloom filter than that one. Uh, and so if you, you know, go look at Mitzenmacher's paper, he tries to come up with a model to analyze this. It's actually tricky because trying to model what a classifier does and trying to say, ah, this is right. You know, un unlike a bloom filter, it's much harder to take a classifier and say, ah, yes, this has a 20% false positive rate. That's a lot harder. So Mitzenmacher does a bunch of work in this paper to try to model the model how this classifier is going to work, so you can analyze the whole system and find the right sizes for your bloom filter. Uh, was it also like uh, anything about like say finding a limit as to like how many blue, how how big the sandwich can be before it like stops ha having a good return on investment kind of thing? Yeah, so I haven't seen anything on more than just this three layer version for bloom filters anyways. Um, so my, my guess is that going beyond this, that at this point you've really already gotten all the benefit out of it. Uh, they're adding, an, adding another classifier in front probably isn't going to help, uh, but I'm not sure, this is all fairly new. So you know, go, go run the experiment and see, um, but uh, yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah. And by the way, I think that, so in the uh, Mitzenmacher has said that he was quite surprised that adding this extra sandwich layer helped. Like this wasn't exactly like at first, at least uh, he said this, this didn't seem intuitive at all that adding this pre filter should help. Uh, but it turned uh, or he, and then he thought maybe it should help a little bit. And then it turned out to help a huge amount. Uh, so this, this is actually not this is not at all obvious this should work uh, intu intuitively I, it doesn't seem clear this should work, uh, but it seems like it does. Uh, there's another question on Zoom. So in the Bloom filter neural network sandwich, are we basically stacking these uh, structures to compensate for each other to reach like a, a asymptotic perfection? So first of all, this is, this is not just about asymptotics. This is actually real performance. So they actually measured this and A, they can get good performance in practice and B, they get really, they get small sizes in terms of actual hard numbers, not just asymptotic performance. 
But the first part, yes, I think absolutely the point is they compensate for uh, they compensate for each other in some sense. In that, you know, the the bloom filters have no false negatives. They are great at getting the no answer correct, uh, but they have the problem of false positives. Especially if you squeeze them very small, they can have a reasonably high rate of false positives. Whereas I think my impression is the classifiers have sort of the opposite behavior. Uh, you know, if some, if the classifier has been trained on something and it says yes, I've seen this before, it really probably has. Right? If it answers yes, the answer probably really is yes. Uh, but if it says no, eh, then it's harder to say for sure whether it means it or not. Maybe it's just something that was out of the training set. Okay. Uh, so I think in some sense there, the reason this works surprisingly well is they exactly compensate for the weaknesses in the other data in the other structure. Okay, so um, thank you, Prof. Seth, once again for the very insightful talk on the algorithms. Thanks. Thank you. So meanwhile, we have a two-minute break while we set up for the next talk. Okay, you see, I wasn't. Uh...
Yes. Oh, okay. That works. Okay, so next up we have Edison Lim and he'll be having a talk on hacking finance. So let's welcome him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hello everyone. Um, thanks for making time on a, um, I guess it's Friday, Friday night um, to come down here for this talk. Um, so I'm just going to talk about hacking finance today. And it is related to the DeFi, uh, which um, I guess that in, in some ways, the professor, uh, Professor Seth, have talked about just now on blockchain. Um, I'm just going to focus more on the application within the blockchain, which is which is more about DeFi uh, in general. Um, so this is the agenda for this talk. Um, so uh, I guess first of all, I must lay down the context as to why is there a DeFi movement, what it is about. Um, along the way, I'll give you some basic introductions to different uh, DeFi protocols. Um, like things like borrowing and lending, like synthetic assets, um, stable coins. Um, the, the, I will talk about some composability part of like DeFi protocols because like this is a NUS hackers talk, so plan to make sure that you guys got some knowledge to hack together something yourself. And uh, finally, I guess like towards the end, I will talk about um, uh, I'll put, be putting together a short script to do a flash loan um, to kind of like. Um, and there is also on this for the call to get a loan and do some interesting um, usage of that. Mm. So how I actually position this like, talk is to assume that most of you in this talk has um, um, maybe not interacted with any DeFi for the course. Maybe. Oh. Okay. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so. So just a quick show of hands. I can't see from the Zoom um, Zoom side of the participants, but from this room, how many of you have actually interacted with any DeFi for the course? Oh, you have. Nice one, Professor. <laughs> and I guess that you are the only one in this lecture hall. Um, so which means that probably I just assume that all of you right here, I'm just taking a sample size from this room that most of you have no, no prior experience. So I'm just going to start off with the most basic part of that and slowly go into more and more advanced uh, side of things. So um, I guess before everything, I'm just going to introduce myself really quickly, um, who I am. Um, so I started crypto back in 2017. Um, I still recall like the, the first time that I used or tried to buy a crypto myself was to transfer myself money in the US. Um, I was studying in the US back then and um, just trying to transfer money from Singapore to the US. It's crazily expensive to do a bank transfer using like DBS or whatsoever. It costs like $100 to do like a few thousand dollars of transfer. And being a poor student, like I was, uh, so I started to look into ways to get cheaper transfer. And I found like Ethereum that can, can actually do that easily. Um, so that's kind of why, where I began. Um, subsequently that, um, and, and right now what I am doing is to, is to build a new protocol called Savera which is a payments protocol that is trying to make um, payments in general easier. We make things like subscriptions possible on blockchains. And uh, we make things that uh, will allow you to do automated, automated actions um, on, on, uh, on Web 3.0, which is the, 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 the term that we use to call um, blockchain systems in general. Then um, along the way, I, I mean, on the side, I'm, I also call myself a U farmer. I will explain to you what U farmer means, but just bear in mind this term right over there. Um, just a bit of my work uh, experience wise, uh, I started as a data engineer back in CMU. Um, it was in a research lab, just trying to really like uh, get some extra pocket money for my, for my studies. And uh, so that's how I started, was working there for like one, one plus years. Then um, along, so then I think 2018, I joined Zedeka um, in Singapore. So Zedeka is a Singapore-based blockchain project. It is a high throughput blockchain project, uh, which is um, maybe started up by Professor Pratik Satsina, if you guys know him in, in this room. Um, then uh, after Zedeka, I moved on to Zedeka's like sister company, which is called Achilles. But the name is just a reverse of Zedeka, so we are related in some sense. Uh, it is in advertising technology, trying to make things like um, advertising more transparent and efficient. Uh, we, we, we do things like permission blockchains over there. 
So I guess like got a fair share of experience on both like public and private side of things. Um, and with like, I think the, the more boring side of things is like, um, I was like, uh, I did my master's in CMU and uh, specifically I focused on distributed systems, which is like um, what we call blockchains today. So during that then we look into like things like consensus protocol, but uh, this wasn't what the, the focus of this talk is about today. So um, just wanted to go through like traditional, I think because DeFi, if we talk about DeFi, we have to first of all understand what uh, are defined as a trade fi, traditional finance. Uh, it's things that we use like very commonly today. Things like your bank accounts, your insurance, um, and all these things are like they 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 um they, they, they custodize your funds. So let's say that you put your money in DBS, and DBS is actually taking care of your money, and DBS can can one day just tell you that hey, you know what, Edison, um, I don't have any uh records of your of your money, and your money is lost, and you can't do anything about that. So that's like kind of like how. We call things like custody that they, they custodize our funds, and this is a, is a risk, as we see in like some countries, um, not in Singapore, of course. Um, there are also a lot of intermediaries in, in TradeFi. So, like the, the, the way that I started exploring crypto was because of to get around the expensive international tra um, transfer. And that's because to transfer money from Singapore to, let's say, Pittsburgh, which is where I was based, it has to hop by three banks at least. And all these banks are charging a fee in each hops. So um, TradeFi is expensive because there are a lot of intermediaries. There are a lot of banks that are trying to get a cut of, of transaction, every transaction that you are you're making. And that's not that great. A lot of like KYC requirements and you don't really have any choice over your service provider. So those are what we define as like TradeFi. Um, we, we, we use it every day, um, but it is not the, I mean that it, it can be better. So that's like how I would put it. Uh, in DeFi, I would say that it's a, it's a movement. Uh, it's a movement because it's still in constant change over time. Um, it really got a lot of traction, I would say, towards the end of last year. So many things are still evolving as we speak today, and uh, it's a very fast-moving space. Um, we, in DeFi, we, we talk about many things such as your distributed ledger, which is your um, Ethereum, let's say. Like, on Ethereum, you have your smart contracts. Um, you have your tokens, like things like your Bitcoin or your Ether. Um, other things are like you have like oracles and you have like stable coins, which I will explain in a minute. But you have many different things on top of the blockchain that uh, you could interact and use, um, and that's kind of like what uh, what we are interested about today. If we try to put things across in different layers, you can see that uh, from the bottom you have the most base layer, which is your Ethereum. You, this is where you talk about your consensus protocol, you talk about networks, you talk about like um, dynamic networks. Or, um, and on top of that, it gets more and more application specific. You start to create tokens um, and you start to have different use case for tokens, like you create maybe smart contracts um, that interact with tokens in some way that will give you uh, a, a better return over time. Um, and you start to have like aggregators, things are like maybe helping you to get the best exchange rate across multiple exchanges. Uh, so that's how we layer things across in, in, the, in the DeFi space. Um, so like, let's say that if you were trying to get your hands on, um, on, 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 on DeFi, so like, um, like, so from your bank, what you would do is to go into something like, um, like I think Binance.sg is, is the one way that you can get your, your cash into, into the crypto space. So once you get your first IFA, that, that's where you actually get access to the web three space. And that's where you can actually do many things such as like interacting with the apps. Um, you can start to maybe transfer money to your, to your friends in, um, in, in other countries without the high transaction fees. And all these things happen on the blockchain network. So this is how uh, I will actually focus today. So I think that I, I, I'm, I'm putting these slides because most of the time we talk about crypto, people think about Binance.com, but Binance.com is, 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 is not the destination. It's a, it's a great place for doing like exchanges, but um, there are a lot of magic, which I'll show you in, in the next few minutes um, on how, or this DeFi protocols interact with each other. The advantages are that if we manage to, to, to really achieve um, DeFi, it allows better efficiency about uh, how capital flows in the system. In a sense that you could actually use um, the same amount of money to actually do more uh, trading or more speculation uh, yourself. You can make more investments uh, with, with the same cash. Um, so for example, let's say that I can buy maybe, um, Let's say I can buy an asset 
let's say maybe uh, I can think about gold, for, for, for instance. I can buy gold and I can collateralize the gold and get a loan. And I can use, use the money, I can use the loan to buy other things. And all these things are on, because it's on blockchain, it's very, it's very composable. composable. It can interact with various protocols, and that's where this efficiency, efficiency stems from. Uh, there's a lot of open finance, transparency, and self-custody. Those are really good ideas to have uh, in, in the very sovereign world where everyone owns their own identity. And um, I think that for programmers like myself and maybe for you guys is that automation and interoperability is the best thing about DeFi. You could put so much things into it, and, uh, and it, it will just work. The, for, the thing, for the same thing that you're trying to do in trick five, you can't really do it because there's a lot of gatekeepers along the way. Um, they're trying to make sure that you can't really get access to a, to a bank system to do uh, some actions. And so, so that's kind of what we are trying to really achieve in DeFi. Um, that is basically empowering every programmer to be a superstar in some sense. Um, so just now I talk about yield farmers. So what yield farmers is that in, in DeFi, different things actually give you like returns. So yield farmers are basically a group of people like myself who is always looking into deploying our capital in the best and most efficient way. Uh, to either like to maybe get a high return on our own assets. Um, so many services on the on, on, on the Ethereum blockchain, they, they charge a fee to the users. And as a capital provider, I can use capital uh, to, to provide the service. So for instance, if people are trying to exchange between two assets, I could give them, uh, I could allocate my capital into a liquidity, liquidity pool and allow people to swap between two assets. In the process, I earn a fee let's say 0.3% fee. And this is great. Um, so this is where uh, yield farmers come from. Uh, different protocols have different returns, uh, depending on how nascent they are in the development life cycle or depending on the usage. Um, and we always find, try to find things that uh, maybe give us the best return. So let's say that uh, on the right side is a screenshot of Sushi. Uh, that, was, that was where I actually began yield farming back in Q4 last year. Um, there are they, they were trying to create a new token. So, so what they're trying to attract is a liquidity liquidity provider to, to give their, their tokens to them. Um, it, I, I should not use the word give, but more like delegate the access on, on the on the platform so that they can use the, the tokens to deliver a service to the end user. So that's kind of how uh, there are people like um like like me who is trying to capitalize on, on, on this fact. So there are different DeFi applications that I talk about that will give you the use. So those are like, in, uh, I'm just gonna cover four in the, in, the, uh, in the interest of time, which is like, which is like decentralized exchanges um, and uh, borrowing lending, synthetic assets and stable coins towards the end. So decentralized exchange, it is to achieve a very simple um, use case, which is that I would like to maybe exchange my ether into some other coins. So let's say USDC, which is a USD coin. And, and to do that, uh, we call it automated market makers, meaning to say that um, we use a constant product function x times y equals to k um, to, to kind of balance the pool. Uh, I will show you a more graphical as, example later on. And um, the, re the relative price of this, this pairs can actually give you uh, the, the, the price that you want to trade on the token. So on the right side, I, I was just showing you that, yes, that you can trade between Ether. You can get this amount from, like, from Sushi today. Um, yep. So the problem that it's trying to solve is, um, is that it's trying to bring an exchange into a, in, into a blockchain. But that's, that has some limitations because if you think about your Binance.com or your centralized exchanges, they, they run an order book. So what, how an order book works is that you can actually place the orders into an into exchange and your, your, your bids are being sorted by price. So let's say that if I'm trying to sell, like, um, sell, sell a token, it is an ask, asking price. It is sorted in, um, in let's see, so let's say that if you are trying to, uh, to, to be the first one to sell, you're, you're, you're sorting by uh, ascending order of, of, of price. And on the other hand, if you are trying to buy, of course you want to buy in the cheapest um, price possible. So you're sorting by descending order of price. So along the way, if we meet in the middle, so that's when the market price is formed. So that's how centralized exchanges work. On the, on the DeFi space, there isn't really a, a good way to do this central limit or the book. So what people do is to introduce this, this thing called AMM. Um, it is that we introduce two different participants. One is a liquidity provider who has maybe some capital in, uh, in let's say, Ether and also at USDC. 
So what we do is that we deposit these tokens into into Uniswap or Sushi, uh, which is like a, a, which is which is an exchange, and you get a liquidity provider share. On the other side of of the, of the table, we have a traders who's trying to swap between tokens. So let's say that I'm trying to swap one ether into like three thousand four hundred USD today. Um, so that's how um, these two participants are coming together. On on the trader side, you can see that when when I actually execute a trade. That's when that um, that the trades actually change the balance of, of, of the of the reserve because of the function. The way that the function is defined, when you come in with like uh, we actually take away some tokens from the pool, the the price curve changes and that reflects the new price of the of the token. Um, so they and all these things happen over time and uh, and there are always like different actors like arbitrages which are coming to really balance the price between different exchanges. Um, but this is how, like how I think that that's actually works today on AMM side. So um, on the liquidity provider, it is that they because they provide the two token pairs uh, together. So if one side is kind of like imbalanced in some sense, it will incentivize people to provide liquidity in in um in, into the pool again. So as this kind of like uh, change over time, that there are traders and there are liquidity providers. Um, the market price reaches an equilibrium. Uh, that's where um, the, 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 the real market price is being reached. Um, we can see that increased liquidity actually reduce like slippage over time uh, because we, we, what we don't want to do is that if you're trying to trip between a, a token and that moves the curves a lot. Um, so we call that a slippage. If I'm trying to get like one, like $3,400 with one ether, but let's say if I try to change 1,000 ether for USDC, then I'll, I may get a slippage of say 5%, which is not ideal. So, um, so in, in some sense, we, we want more and more liquidity into a platform. And that's also one of the reasons why protocols will be happy to give you and you on your, uh, on your liquidity. Um, yeah. AMM uh, has changed a lot of the time. Um, in, I would say like last year, a lot of the world is still in the AMM, uh, but today there's a lot of innovation. So it started as a very simple, like, S times Y equals to K formula, uh, but there are some performance limitations there, and there are some like not so good designs of, about capital efficiency. So it evolved so much that there are protocols like Bancor, or like there are protocols like uh, Uniswap V3 that that tries to solve this in a in, in a better way. Um, all these things are, are still evolving, but I won't cover that in detail. Yeah. Um, another thing that maybe I just want to show is like. Uh, Borrowing and lending. These are one thing that you could do on, on DeFi. So what you essentially do is that let's say that if I hold some tokens, maybe I hold uh, ETH, and I think that ETH is going to go, um, it's, it's going to hold its price in the long on, in the long run. But along the way, I realized that maybe I might need some USDC to do other things. Maybe to invest in a new uh, up and coming startup that I want that that, that my friend introduced me to. And, um, and instead of selling my ether, what I can do is to take a loan against my, my, my ETH. And uh, this is possible on like protocols like Aave and uh, Compound. So um, maybe I guess it might just be better if I show you some of this uh, protocol live so that you can, uh, you can, you can see and uh, appreciate what's happening. So this is Aave, which is, uh, which is a protocol for people to lend and borrow. So right now there's around like 20, 24 billion in the, in the entire ecosystem. In Aave itself, you could see that you could, you could give, you could deposit your tokens into, into that platform. For instance, you could maybe deposit your, your, your ETH into that and you can get a certain return for, for, for your tokens. Um, you can even do uh, your, your, your BTC uh, if you are like kind of like having a long position on BTC. So once you have that, you get the uh, you, you you get uh, you you get collateral in the system, and that collateral will determine how much you can borrow. So on this borrow side, you could see how much uh, interest rate you have to pay if you were to borrow against your 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 token. So um so this is like a very I would say a very straightforward way that uh, a a protocol can really deliver value that this. Lending, lending and borrowing can be very useful in, in, um, later on when I show you the demo about how I fit everything together. Yeah, so now jumping back into the, uh, the, the slides. We have like stable coins, which are like, um, as we know, like cryptocurrency price change a lot over time. 
it can fluctuate 10% in a single day, like today, for instance. It just went out 10% today. And, um, and it is the way it is. We, we can't change the fact about market and uh, speculators. Um, so people introduce stable coin, which are meant to be packed against uh, like a centrally issued um, maybe currency like USD. So I could maybe have a USDC, which is a stable coin to hold your, your, your pack against that. Um, there are two different kinds of like uh, stable coins. There are the centralized one, which are like issued by um, companies like Tether. The idea is that they hold assets in their own balance sheets. Things like things like, are like their, their bonds or maybe cash. Um, on the other side, and, and, uh, and they rely on auditors to, to audit against the, the code base and, uh, and their balance sheet to make sure that they have enough money to back the supply of tokens. Uh, on the other side, we have decentralized stable coin. So the idea is that people could actually create stablecoin, uh, maybe based off the value of ether. So for instance, I could, I could give a, uh, I could create DAI, uh, which is a stablecoin based on providing like ether. It's, the collateral ratio is around 150%. So which means that um, to, to create $10,000 worth of DAI, I need to have like $15,000 worth of ether in the system before I can create that. Um, so uh, and a lot of stable coins are being used by traders all over the world that for, for things like maybe temporarily um, storing your, uh, your assets in the stable coin. So it, it does not fluctuate that much. So there's a real demand for, uh, for things that are in the market. Another one is like decentralized derivatives. So uh, derivatives in short is that it is a contract for an underlying asset. Um, you, don't own, you don't own an asset in, um, in, in name, but you own um, maybe a, a, a certain price in, the, in that. So, so let's say that this, um, and it, within this de derivatives, there are derivatives like maybe futures contract and, and options, which, are, which I won't cover today, but something that's interesting is like synthetic assets. So on the DeFi world, there are people creating like different assets, like your, um, your, your stocks, like US like, stocks in the, in the market. And um, how it actually works is that if to, to create a, a, a token like this, you have to provide um, your collateral and you mint a token. Let's say you mint a, a, a Tesla, um, Tesla stock, and, um, and you can use, use that to, to trade. So, um, so I'm just going to show you a quick example as to how uh, all these, uh, like how um, a protocol will work. So this is like a mirror, which is a, which is a synthetic exchange. So a mirror, you can see that there are things like uh, you can trade between different, um, different, different stocks in the market. So like Microsoft stock, you can trade against like um, Apple. You can trade against like uh, maybe like Gold. I think there's Gold somewhere here. Um, the idea is that someone behind the scenes has already been uh, been minting this and selling in in the market. And yes, they sell for some premium because there are crypto traders who don't have access to these like, products. So for instance, let's say that if you're trying to trade US stocks in, in Singapore, you have to basically pass some uh, regulations and some, some education to, 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 to get your access granted. Uh, we are quite lucky in Singapore, to be honest. But let's say if you are someone based in China, you can't really buy US stocks that easily. And uh, this is where I guess that with uh, decentralized like, um, derivatives like this, you could actually enjoy um, being able to speculate on the price of Apple or Tesla if you really like Tesla a lot. Um, and uh, this is something that is, is possible in DeFi. So jumping back into, um, in, in, into the slides. So not everything is perfect. Um, I must put a disclaimer to all of this. Um, many things in DeFi is very experimental. Like I say, the movement is very early and like many things are still um, still a, a work in progress. There are interesting things that, which I think that might inspire some of you. Things like your network risk. How do you uh, make sure that a protocol is safe and a consensus, consensus protocol is performant over time? Um, things like consensus attacks, uh, smart contract code, um, and stable coins. Um, I put the, the caption called stable coins because many things like decentralized stable coins are still. Um, a work in progress that we are still trying to see whether these things work or not. Uh, for example, sometimes a, a huge crash in, 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 in the market may actually affect the, um, the, the price of a stable coin. The, a stable coin can actually go uh, in, in, in not a very stable way. For instance, it may lose like 8% in a single day uh, if a stable coin is not well designed. 
<clears throat> yeah, and uh, I think regulators are also trying to figure out whether stable coins like USDT and USDC are uh, within the uh, the regulatory parameters. Um, yeah, so those so um, so those are like DeFi risks that uh, that I won't go into detail on that. Um, but I just really want to make use of the basis of time to talk about like flash loans, which I can explain some of this concept in in a much better way. Okay, so um, so I'm just gonna demo like what's a flash loan. So before a demo was a flash loan, I have to tell you what a flash loan is. Um, otherwise, it, it, it really doesn't make sense. Uh, so a flash loan is that um, I can actually take a... Um, so first of all, how flash loans are possible is that blockchain enables atomic transactions. And what is atomic is that if you recall from the distributed systems class is that atomic transaction is indivisible and it would, um, the, the uh, uh, series of operations that either all occurs or none actually occurs. So it is a, it is a system where there isn't a partial um, partial complement of like transactions. So, and flash loans are a form of under, under collateralized like loans in a sense that you can actually take, uh, because blockchain enable atomic transactions, you can take a loan that is much bigger than your collateral um, or even having no collateral at all. Um, and because, and how this actually makes sense is that liquidity is actually returned at the end of the transaction. So I'll, I'll show you later on how, how we ensure that on the code level. Um, and the use case is it can, it, can, it can be done for like things like arbitrage. So arbitrage in general means that if I'm a trader, I find that, hey, I'm, I, can buy, um, I can buy Ether at a much cheaper place on, on, on this exchange. And I can sell it on a, on a higher price on the other exchange. And therefore, what I want to do is to try to capitalize on the fact that there is a cap capital inefficiency. I want to take a loan to buy lots and lots of Ether from the first exchange and sell it for a second one. And uh, and a profit along the way, yeah. And all these things are not possible in in uh, in centralized finance. So which is why I was I I thought that it was a good idea to talk about this in um in today's like um talk. So um an example is like something like this. So DYDS is a uh, is a lending is a uh, I mean they do flash loans on the liquidity that is on the platform. So an arbitrage is can um can take a flash loan for say that like, two million USD. And he may be maybe he found a, a good way to actually earn this money uh, in, in other forms. For instance, I find that there are two markets that are giving me uh, rates in a way that I can actually earn a profit. And I'm just going to take a loan, uh, exchange my USDC into DAI on the first exchange, uh, first market. And secondly, is that I'm going to exchange um, the DAI that I've gotten for the first, uh, the first market into USDC. And, uh, and I'm just going to return the USDC back into DYDS. Along the way, I will uh, I, I may return the, the whole I will, I will return the whole sum and the and the interest, and I may also end up with some rewards. So that's how flash loan actually works in concept. Yep. So, um, so like I'm just gonna go into code level to show you guys how some of these things work. Um, so on the code level, so this is like um, let's see, okay. So this is a, a, a standard smart contract about how a flash loan contract will work. So this is, a, firstly, it's written in solidity. The first thing that you want to really see is that you have address provider, which is, uh, in this case, it is going to be the lending um, address, lending pool address that we have uh, actually imported right over here. So at the bottom, you can, uh, we, we, have a, we have two functions that are, that are really interesting, interesting to us. So one is that um, in this uh, flash loan, what we are trying to do here is to exchange um, like 0 0.01, I think it, yeah. So we are trying to exchange 0 0.01 uh, ether into, in, uh, I mean, we are, we are, we're trying to flash loan and borrow like 0 0.01 ether from the, from the platform. You can see there's a lot of like zeros here because like uh, on, on Ethereum, you can't really express the decimal points. So uh, that's why like, um, to, to express like one ether that's like one and 18 zeros behind. So, um, yeah. And what we're trying to do here is that we're trying to put the address of the web ether into, um, in, uh, in, into a byte array. And secondly, I'm just trying to put a amount there. So where do I actually derive all these things is that 
uh, we are currently we are using like Downy, which is like a development framework that will allow us to actually do, do this. Just a minute. Yeah. So Brownie has a, has a config where we could actually put um, different parameters like the contract address over here. So um, today I'm just going to demonstrate how things work on Coven, Coven testnet, which is right over here. So those, those two are the, are the addresses that I'm interested about. Things like Aave, which is like they, they deploy the landing pool on the Coven testnet. And there's also like Red Reader, which is, uh, this is the token address of the Red Reader. Then um, towards the, the top, we have like um, other functions that, that, are, that are kind of interesting that you have a flash loan. So this function, I've taken it from Aave document. Um, so um, I'm just running and run, run you guys through on like the different parameters. What, what it needs is a receiver address, which is the current address of the, this contract. Then you have your assets, which is uh, in, in our case is, is a red meter. The amount, which is a 0 0.01 red meter. So the most is actually the, uh, the, kind of, the kind of loan that you want to make. So in our way, you can actually take three different kinds of loan. One is the flash loan, which doesn't require any collateral. The second one is a stable loan, which, uh, which, uh, which is that like I'm taking a loan and I'm paying a stable rate of interest over time. And variable is that I'm just paying a variable rate over time. Uh, so this, those might be helpful if you're trying to do other things that are not flash loan. But today I'm just going to use like um, zero as the, as the as the mode of transaction. And, um, and for params and referral code, those two are not that important. Um, so towards the top, right? Um, so once we actually execute this transaction, so this is where um, things actually get interesting because this is where, um, so, this, so once the contract has the fund that it has requested, it will go into this transaction. And once it is in this transaction, you can actually do uh, logic, for example, like I'm trying to capitalize between like two, uh, two markets. Um, in, in, my, in my case, I'm, I'm not trying to do that today, but um, you can actually write any code you want over here. Um, but towards the end, that's where the protocol must make sure that it has enough liquidity to return to the protocol. So this is where, um, uh, because like, uh, um, so this is where the, the contract actually make sure that if I borrow $2 million worth of USDC, I can return $2 million back into uh, Aave. And if this is not possible, then the whole transaction will, be, will not occur. So, um, so this is how um, I structured this, like, this contract over here. Then towards the, um, and I'm just gonna show you like two other, two other scripts that will, will allow me to actually, um, that I'm, I'm just gonna use later on. So because like, um, Many of these uh, transactions are, are in red so I must first obtain some red meter myself. And on, on here, I've actually created an, an address where, where I'm trying to make trying to do the, the flash loan. So in this address here, I'm um, I currently have I have some ether, but I will just try go and request some more from uh from the faucet. So um so if you need to interact with any blockchain protocols, you will only, always need ether uh, because that's where you actually need to pay the fees. Yeah. Okay, so um, once you're requested, then it should go into your account that, um, that we can verify from this transaction link that the transaction is in. It takes some time to index. So this is a blockchain explorer, which will tell you, um, which will tell you like uh, maybe more things about your transaction, like for example, whether has it has it been confirmed, and how much money you're trying to transfer. Yeah, it's just gonna take some time, but I think that I've already received, yeah, so I was zero point seven just now, and then now I'm, I have received the test iter. So um, the first thing that I want to do right now is to is to convert my some of my ether into red meter. And that's that's necessary because the interest rate for the flash loan is paid in red meter. And um yeah. So to do that, um, because I'm currently using Brownie, but you can actually use any like smart contract platform that you that you that you have uh, that you're used to, like hot hack. 
Um, so the way to run it is to just run a script and then get a web with her. I'm going to specify but that my network is currently like Coven. So I'll give it some time to, to, to load. Okay, so if you see a long string over here, this is the transaction hash that is the, that can be found on the blockchain. So um, if I look into this transaction on the on the block explorer, you can see that um, we have managed to actually deposit that into into a protocol, um, and uh, that will give me a red return. Again, it takes some time to, to really index. Uh, but what, what I just want to make sure is that just now I had like zero by eight ether. Now it's like it's actually lesser than that, and I have zero by three rep if over here. So this is what I want uh, uh, today. So secondly, is that um, the next thing that I'm going to do is to deploy the contract that I've shown you just now. So um, and that's the contract that is doing the flash loan. So to do that, I've also similarly prepared the um, the contract ahead of time. So um, so this is a deployment contract. It's nothing fancy. I'm just trying to deploy deploy the contract um, that I've shown you guys just now. So, uh, which is the, this contract? Yep. And to do this, um, I'm just going to do a deployment uh, script. Again, I'm going to specify the network is covent. Yep, so this transaction has actually been um, been confirmed, and this is the transaction, uh, the contract address that the, the new smart contract is being deployed in. Uh, to really look through that, I can show you how it looks like on chain. Um, so again, we just paste the transaction link here, and um, and you can just verify over time. Yeah. Um, but I'm just going to skip into the next part, which is to to run the actual flash loan. So now that I've actually gotten some red if. I transferred my red if into um sorry, I've gotten some red if from the um from um from the from the earlier transactions and I've deployed a new flash loan contract. So the next thing I'm gonna do is to fund the flash loan contract with some rep eater, and then I'm gonna take a flash loan and I'm going to um and return the, the, the flash loan back into the protocol all in one tran transaction. So um because most of the logics are being written on, on chain already. So um, right now, what I really have to do is to really just call that function that is uh, performing that flash loan. So, um, so let's see. Yeah. So this is the function that I'm trying to do. Um, first of all, what I'm doing is to check whether it has enough data in the, um, the, the paper interest, if it doesn't have it then I will transfer some of my red data into the contract. Then once I've done that, then I'll call the function called flash loan, which is the one that I've actually shown you guys earlier on on the contract. And uh, if everything is successful, then um, it should reach this line over here. So um, to do that, similarly, we'll, we'll use Brownie again, since I've actually have the, have the script. Yeah, so this will take some time because there are like two transactions that will happen. So let's give it some time. So the first transaction has, 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 um, has succeeded, which is that I funded the contract with some red eater. It has confirmed. And I'm executing the second transaction, which is to execute the flash loan. And um, it's, it is confirmed as well. So um, just going to load it here and give it some time for it to index. Yeah. So to, to, to blow up the um, uh, the screen and really show you guys what's happening is that um, what I just did was that I've actually borrowed um, zero by one the right return from uh, from 
from, from the protocol from Aave. And um, I've written I've written that the number of word iter back into Aave plus the interest rate. So this this 0, 0, 0, 009 is the interest rate. Um, so you can see that if you are able to actually do something useful with the loan, you can uh, this is the amount of interest that you have to return. So um, and that can be pretty useful if you're trying to do some arbitrage. Usually, usually the premium uh, for arbitrage is, is very, very small. It can be like 0 0.01% uh, for, 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 for some like token pairing. So which is why you need a flash loan of like say a few million dollars to make sure that you earn enough money to, um, to, to, to make it profitable. Yeah. So this is the end of the demo. Um, yeah, so towards the end, I just want to really just tell you guys that like DeFi is actually still, it's, it's very disruptive and we are not done. Um, there's a lot of interesting things that you can do in this space. So if we really look into the usage over time, you can see that the total value locked in DeFi has actually increased a lot in the last one year, um, especially. And on the right side is the stablecoin supply in the world. So um, this is a bit small over here, but basically we have actually went from around, I think that 2020 towards September, that's like $10 billion worth of stablecoin. Uh, one year later, currently there's around 100 and $23 billion in the stablecoin supply. So this is a market that is growing very fast over time and uh, it's a good time to really explore um, maybe some research and development in, in this area. Um, there are many research that are possible, things like, like scalability. Um, those, are, those are kind of the problems that the, I think the Zilliqa team was trying to solve uh, back in my previous workplace. Um, usability, and which is what I'm trying to solve right now. Um, there are privacy issues with uh, blockchain today as well, in a sense that everyone everyone can see everyone's transactions on, on chain. So this is not quite ideal for some people. Um, security is always going to be one um, uh, growing concern. Things are like your oracles, your consensus protocol, program language, um, and legal framework for those lawyers over here. So um, those are, I think that, uh, would be good that uh, you guys maybe can uh, look into this if you're interested. Um, yeah, but yeah, I've come to the end and just want to give my credits to to these few um, links that are, that have contributed materials in, into this slide. And um, if you would like to connect with me, I'm, I can be reached on Twitter, and you can scan this to to really connect on Twitter if you're lazy to type the link. Yeah. So that's it. Happy to address any questions from the floor. Uh, hi, so there's two questions on the chat right now. So um, from Kimberly, so I'll just read out the first question first. Um, so Kimberly asked, the current system uses a fractional reserve system and DeFi is currently over collateralized. How do they compare in terms mm. of capital efficiency and can DeFi bridge that gap? Um, the short answer is that the capital efficiency in, in lending is still not on par with like the current system. Um, because one, one thing that we can't really do on blockchain is like credit system. So if you think about mortgage, for example, let's say I, I, I buy a house. I buy a house for like uh, $1 million. And I don't have a million dollars, but the bank will happily give me that, that, that mortgage. So, and that's not how it works on DeFi. Because I, let's say in, in the real world, if I can't pay the loan, then they got other things, other ways to actually, actually go around. For example, they can take the house back. They can, um, they can, they can bankrupt me. Uh, they can use like any law house to, to actually get the money back. But that's not how it works on DeFi. So in DeFi, loans always have to be over collateralized, uh, which is kind of like, I think is a characteristic of a system that is self-sustaining. Uh, but I can also see the arguments that it is not as capital efficient as today. Yeah. yeah thanks for the answer. Then the second question is, uh, how much of the reduced efficiency in the current traditional banking systems is on purpose rather than structural. So for example, requiring users to fulfill basic tests before they're able to trade options, um, if, um, yeah, to avoid them losing all their capital. So um, I believe DeFi is not possible to regulate, but could it also result in many people not knowing what they're doing and possibly suffering losses? Mm, yep, it is, it is the case. So DeFi, we can't regulate things. Um, and actually, actually anyone could, could do like trades, for example, on uh, trading futures 
Uh, so futures are a type of like uh, derivatives which are pretty dangerous if you do not know what you're doing. Uh, but so let's say if you're trying to trade that on like traditional stocks, you can't trade it on SGS unless you are maybe have met a certain level of like um, financial literacy. Uh, but you can't really regulate that on, on, on DeFi. So anyone could just put some USDC and Ether to, to do that. And they might lose the money. Um, so I guess this is where uh, I think that, I mean, on, on one hand, you can, you can think about um, that. Maybe you, it's, it's going to be good to actually put that invest, uh, the, the users from, from, from using this irresponsibly. Uh, but on the other hand, I can also think that like, um, if you over restrict people, then people get disgruntled. So, for instance, let's say that if I don't really have, uh, I mean that if I if I can't really trade, say U.S. stocks in Singapore, then I'm actually losing a lot of upside. Uh, in things like Tesla, which is like going up pretty much in in the last one year. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a regulatory expert, but in DeFi, we can't really regulate all these things. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the answer. Are there any other questions from the floor or the chat? So once again, thank you, Edison, for a very meaningful talk. And we hope all of you have a better perspective on Elgos and DeFi today. So thank you very much, everyone. Oh, there's one more question. Also, sorry, there's one more question and we'll read it out. Yeah. Um, so the question is, if, if, if DeFi is not perfect, if it's costly and it's not really scalable, why is it so big in the ETH ecosystem? Um, mm, okay. Um, so my personal thoughts is that there is a, me as someone who has, who has been through this journey, um, I've seen that I can do a lot more opportunities on Ethereum that I can't do on other, other places. So there are a lot of like people who try to think about, I'm just going to kill, for example, they think about killing Ethereum. They say Ethereum sucks and I can do a better system. But it, I mean, things are not really about, like it's not about TPS, like transaction per second or like efficient, like transaction costs at the end. At the end, I think that what people really care about is the protocols that are on Ethereum. So Ethereum has a lot of protocols. So let's say the flash loan that I was trying to do just now, I can't do a flash loan on a protocol like Terra, for instance. So Terra is a, is a blockchain that makes a transaction cheaper, but there is no flash loan there. So I can't really do that. And there's also not a lot of tokens which I can play around. So like for instance, there are many tokens like say Sushi that is not on uh, Terra. So, uh, there are, I think that if you actually see that there's a lot of demand despite being a high cost um, uh, involved in the, in the transaction, then uh, what I would want to ask back is that if people are willing to pay this amount of money to achieve that, then doesn't this show that there's actually value in the system? Yeah, so this is what my counter answer will be. Thanks for that take, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I think there's another question from David. Um, what is your outlook on the take up of algorithmic stable coins like UST and DAI? Uh, because you did mention those during your talk. Yep. Oh yeah, I, I've actually mentioned DAI as well. Um, I think that algorithm, uh, algorithmic um, stable coins are a work in progress in the sense that uh, we have seen how some of these tokens may, may crash like the, the price over time. So for instance, um, like, UST, which is a, which is backed by Luna, uh, on on the Terra ecosystem, it has actually withstand a, a huge shock in price in in May that it actually went down around eight percent. So for a stable coin, losing eight percent of the value is kind of like disastrous in in that sense. Like you, the last thing that you want on a stable coin is that it is not a, it, it is not stable. You want it to be stable. You want your one dollar worth of USD to always be one one USDT or one Dai. So, um, so let's say with a hundred fifty percent collateralized like uh, ratio on Dai, um, we actually we have not seen a case where it actually went down fifty percent in one day, but I guess that it actually went down that much in one day. Then I think that that's when when the um, there will be a true test in the in the in, in the system whether this this thing could work over time. 
uh, we have also, also seen that over time there are also stable coins like ESD or like DSD or like maybe FEI, -E which are like trying to build new, new, new designs in stable coin. They are all good in their own ways, but um, they're failed for, for reasons that are not strictly technical. Things like, like maybe um, people trying to sell, uh, that the sell project is actually immense in, in, in some stages of the time. So it is not being able to withstand all this like um, systematic shock. Yeah. So um, I think that stablecoin is, is still going to be a very active topic that people want to explore. Uh, right now, I think DAI, DAI is actually pretty pretty good as a stablecoin. Then I think UST, uh, since May 2021, it has actually re managed to resolve that they are, managed to maintain the pack uh, pretty well. Uh, thanks again for answering the questions and yeah, in, in general for the talk. Um, yeah, I think that's that would be it. Um, yeah, I'll hand the mic back to Ashley. Um, so later we'll be sharing the feedback form in the 